let me begin by welcoming all of you to tonight's panel discussion. The title of our, our panel this evening is Dartmouth 64s and the Vietnam War. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Edward Miller. I'm a professor in the Department of History here at Dartmouth. I'm also the instructor for History 26, which is a course on the Vietnam War. And tonight's panel is a really important part of the curricular content for this course. Uh, we're here to explore a little bit of Dartmouth history and a little bit of American history. And I'm really delighted that we have uh, this turnout. We're, uh, we, we have in the audience here tonight not only uh, the students who are, who are currently enrolled in History 26, but we have some other Dartmouth students, including some Dartmouth student veterans that we're delighted to welcome. Uh, I believe we also may have some members of the Dartmouth ROTC detachment here tonight. And we have a, a number of Dartmouth alumni, both on our panel and, and in the audience. And it's, so it's, it's, this is really a, a, a Dartmouth community event. And it, it's really a pleasure for me to, to welcome you all to it. Uh, this panel is being videotaped. And it will be available on YouTube, not right away, but within a couple of weeks. So if you have friends or, or classmates who, who are unable to attend, uh, you, can, you can refer them to that in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, this panel is jointly sponsored by the Department of History and the Dartmouth Class of 1964. And uh, this requires a little bit of explanation on my part. For the past five years, the members of the Class of 64 have directly supported the teaching and the learning that me and my students have been doing in this class on the Vietnam War. This is actually the fifth edition of this panel. Uh, starting in, in 2012, We've had a rotating group of members of the class of 64 who have traveled to Dartmouth while the course is going on to share their memories and experiences with us, their memories and experiences of the Vietnam War and the Vietnam War era in both Dartmouth and American history. So uh, the, the event tonight is really made possible by the generosity of the class of 64. I want to acknowledge especially the support that we've gotten from Ray, Ray Peters, who's the president of the class, and also Hunt Whitaker who's the secretary. Uh, both of them, as, as I said, have been very supportive. Unfortunately, uh, they couldn't be here tonight. There is, however, another very important 64 who is here, and that's Mr. Uh, Phil Schaefer. Phil is actually the evil genius. Yes. <laughs> Phil is the, the evil genius who came up with the idea for this panel five years ago, and, and without him, none of this would be happening. So we're grateful to you, Phil. Um, I'm going to begin tonight with some very brief remarks about the idea of service as it relates to the Vietnam War, because I think this is going to be an important theme of our, our conversation this evening. Um, in 2015, a historian of the Vietnam War named Christian Appy published an article in which he offered some thoughts on the connections between the Vietnam War and the ways in which Americans currently behave in the 21st century toward military veterans. And Abby noted that one of the most commonly mooted phrases directed at veterans in our society today is, thank you for your service. We hear this phrase at all, in all sorts of contexts, at meetings, at conferences, at concerts, professional sporting events, as well as in ordinary conversation. And I think that this phrase is almost always used with good intentions. However, in his article, Christian Abby argued that the the ubiquitous use and indeed overuse of this phrase, despite the good intentions behind it, can have an unfortunate side effect. By focusing exclusively on thanking veterans for their service, we may be missing some opportunities to learn about their service experiences. And so Appy made a, a very interesting proposal. He said, instead of automatically just saying thank you for your service and leaving it at that, when we, when we encounter veterans and other people with, with experiences to share about the Vietnam War, Abby argues we should consider saying to them, please tell me about your service. And that's what we're going to try to do here tonight. This is the advice we're trying to put into action this evening. We're going to explore various experiences of service, both military service and other kinds of service in uh, Vietnam and the Vietnam War era as it relates to the war. Our panel features a total of six members of the Dartmouth community who have come here to share their personal memories of the Vietnam era. The importance and the salience of the Vietnam War in American history, I think, is undeniable. And for proof of this, we don't have to look any further than just the, the overwhelming and, and, and very diverse response to the recently broadcast documentary film on the war by Ken Burns and, and Lynn Novick. 
And I think as the response to that film shows, the Vietnam War, even today, more than 40 years after it, it remains very much a living issue for Americans. It continues to serve as a touchstone in discussions and debates about politics, culture, and morality. So, so this panel, what we're trying to do here tonight is to explore a very important period in American history, but to do so in a very personal way through the, the experiences and the memories of, of our six panelists. So let me just say uh, a little bit about the, how the, the rest of the evening is going to go. Uh, I'm going to introduce each of the panelists in turn. After I introduce him or her, they will each uh, speak for about five minutes. All of the students in History 26 have already read essays that each panelist has prepared. So, so our students, at least, are, are familiar with, with their backgrounds. Uh, the panelists will have a few minutes to, to introduce themselves and perhaps add a little bit more, more information. And then after everyone's had a chance to introduce themselves, we're going to open it up for, for questions from the audience. Um, when we do have questions, uh, the main stipulation is, first of all, that you have a question, uh, not just a, a speech or, or a comment. Actually, a question in lieu of a speech would be great. Um, the, the second uh, stipulation here is that you need to specify to whom you are uh, directing. Uh, that particular question, since we do have a, a fairly large panel here this evening. All right? So we're going to go ahead, and, and I'm just going to introduce the, the, the panelists in, in alphabetical order. Our, our first panelist is, is Dave DeColesta. Dave entered the U.S. Army after graduating from Dartmouth in 1964. Um, oh, I, I, I've already uh, lied, haven't I? I I've already uh, <laughs> failed to, to go uh, according to, to alphabetical order. Well, that's all right. That's, that's easily. Phil is having a heart attack up here. I can see. <laughs> um, that, that won't be the last mistake that happens tonight, Phil, just so you know. Or it's not the last mistake I'm going to make. Uh, we're going to start with, with, with Rand Beers. Rand Beers, uh, after graduating Dartmouth in 1964, became a U.S. Marine Corps officer. Uh, he served as a rifle company commander in Vietnam from 1966 to 1968. After he returned from Vietnam, he earned a master's degree in military history, and he then began a long career in the, as a foreign and civil servant, in the foreign service and the civil service, I should say. Much of his career uh, was spent in the U.S. State Department. He held several positions at state, including the Assistant Secretary of State for International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Affairs. He has also served on the National Security Council staffs of five presidents, beginning with Ronald Reagan. He served as then-Senator John Kerry's National Security Advisor during Kerry's 2004 U.S. presidential campaign. He has also served in the Department of Homeland Security. But his current duty station is right here in Hanover. He is teaching this fall a senior seminar in the government department on national security policy. Rand Beers. Thank you very much, Ed and Phil, for this opportunity. Uh, it's often said that veterans don't like to talk about their experiences in combat. And I want to thank you for forcing me to write about it for this course. It's the first thing I've ever written about my experience and to have this opportunity uh, to talk about it. My experience in Vietnam was uh, about 20 months. I started as a Marine platoon commander um, around the Da Nang airfield. I moved from there to um, be an operations officer in the 3rd Marine Regiment along the militarized zone in the north. Um, and then um, being young and thinking I was immortal and a little foolish, um, I asked for another six months if I could command the rifle company. Um, and in many ways, that is my Vietnam experience. The first 13 months there were not particularly eventful. Um, my six months as a rifle company commander really made the difference in terms of my own experience in understanding uh, what war is and is not, and how 
bloody and blunt an instrument it is in terms of uh, having uh, Marines under my command die or be seriously wounded. One of the saddest things about that was that, and I was not in any major combat, was that half of the people who died under my <coughs> command died from friendly fire. Either a bomb dropped in the wrong place or an artillery round that was not properly produced uh, in the manufacturing process and in the worst instance by a superior who called in fire on our perimeter thinking he was calling in this fire so that if we were attacked during the night, he would know where the water routes would be fired so he could adjust them depending upon where the attack was. As a company commander, I had to write letters to the families, the next of kin of those individuals. And that was, in many ways, one of the hardest things that I had to do there, particularly in the case of the individuals who died from friendly fire, because I could not say that how they had died. Um, I wasn't in a position to actually state that it was friendly fire, even though I knew that it was. Um, I came home, and as Professor Miller said, uh, worked in government and never forgot about my Vietnam experience in working in the area of national security affairs to the point that some of you know from reading the, the piece that I resigned and retired from government one day before the Iraq war started when I was working at the White House uh, under President George W. Bush. Let me stop there. Thank you. Our next panelist is in alphabetical order. Please decompress him. David entered the U.S. Army after graduating from Dartmouth. He served as a rifle platoon leader in Vietnam during 1967 and 1968. After his military service was complete, he earned a Ph.D. in wildlife ecology. He subsequently became a university professor and taught at both North Carolina State and Oregon State. He then served for over a decade as a U.S. Forestry Service scientist, and he continues to work today as a wildlife forestry consultant. He is also, among other things, a novelist. Uh, Dave currently resides in Colorado uh, with his wife of, I believe it's 52 years. So quite a number of achievements there. David. Very good, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to guess you're going to get a real smorgasbord of, of experiences and uh, comments. Uh, I looked at the things that your professor was suggesting that you take away from this, and uh, the one of us, uh, our experiences, how they affected us, and another was the idea of service. Um, as he said, I was a rifle platoon leader. I went to Officer Candid School. Uh, I'll back up just a little bit and say that um, we got married uh, on 9-11, uh, not a very nice date, and we got back from our honeymoon and I had a draft notice, which I didn't tell my wife about for three weeks, um, but then I was gone. And uh, I was not a philosopher in college, uh, although the best class I had was in philosophy, so I didn't philosophize about the Vietnam War, basically. Um, I was a smash mouth player in football. I was a warrior. They called me. I went. I saw it as my patriotic duty. So I just went. Plus, my father in law served in the Navy in World War II, and my uncle in the Army. And um, like I said, I couldn't have looked him in the eye if I hadn't done it. So I went. And I had a very easy tour of it. Never in the I don't have horrible memories, and I don't have flashbacks. But I did learn a number of things that I would like to relate to you that um, I picked up in the military. 
Uh, one thing was it was really a life-changing experience. Um, when I was in high school, it was white bread. There were no black or brown students. When I came to Dartmouth, it was pretty much the same way. I think I could count on the fingers of what hand the students were not white. So when I was drafted, I went into basic training, and I would say two-thirds of the draftees were black or brown or poor white kids. And so uh, I learned in a hurry about different lifestyles, different upbringing. And the one thing I will say that I really remember well is that these kids were all patriots. They were going to serve their country and do the best they could. And they were great kids. Um, and I also learned about what I'm calling elites, the people who basically exploited the expendables. We were expendables. We were cannon fodder. And we basically did what we were told. Uh, in the military, there's this uh, discipline, uh, line of command. You didn't break the chain of command. You did what you were told. Or just not to question why, you know, that. But um, one of the best pieces of advice my father gave me was uh, you're going to come into situations in your life and you've got three choices. They're not good situations. One is to escape the situation, get another job. Um, and when I was in Vietnam, after about a month, I figured it out that this was not a war we wanted to be in. And uh, I'd had some really bad experiences about the superiors, the elites. <laughs> Uh, putting us into these situations that um, were very dangerous, not necessary. Um, and so I learned to cope a little bit, but I couldn't change the situation. I couldn't leave. My attitude after a couple of months was uh, not search and destroy. It was search and avoid. You know, I wanted to bring all of my boys back. I didn't lose any. Um, so I couldn't really change my attitude and carry on because my attitude was save them. So the last thing my father said was change the situation. And that's what I did. And I wrote about that. I would get orders. We would go out in the field and execute the mission. But there were different ways of executing the mission, and which I did with my platoon sergeants. Um, and we made it through. What I learned about dealing with elites, and these are the people commanding us, um, and some of you have heard this term, cognitive dissonance. Basically, um, people will disagree with you because they have a different perception. And these people had never had, these commanders, had never had combat experience in guerrilla warfare. And so they would put us into these pretty seriously bad situations, but you couldn't tell them that. You couldn't tell them they were wrong. So basically, you had to come up with a way of saying, Let's look at the situation and see if we can see it the same way and come up with a solution that's a little better. And I've learned that that carried through with all kinds of places in life. People that I worked for would have a different idea, and I could disagree with them, or maybe I could change the way they looked at things, and that really did help. A couple of other things from my service, and that is... Um, get a mentor. When I arrived, I was a green lieutenant. I didn't know how to run a combat operation in the field, but platoon sergeants did. And so basically, I was a shadow for a couple of weeks. Anyway, I said, look, you're going to run the show. You're going to tell me how to do this right. And they did. Um, because of that, I also learned that you listen to subordinates, listen to these expendables who you're commanding, because they have good ideas. And if you listen to them and respect what they're saying, they'll be yours. Uh, and the last thing I was lead by example. Um, and basically, uh, never ask anybody to do something you wouldn't do. And so sometimes I would take the point. And the point is basically the first person in the line moving the train. This is the guy that's going to get into crap first. Um, and I did it a few times every now and then just to show them that, you know, you could do it. I'm with you. And I think they really appreciated that. Um, so basically, never ask anybody who works for you to do something that you wouldn't do and actually prove it by doing it. So that's basically um, what I had to say. I've got one last thing, and that is, by virtue of your intelligence and your position here, what you're going to learn, you're going to become elites. But you'll always be in the middle, unless you're president, God forbid which means someone is going to be supervising you 
and telling you what to do. And you're going to have to find a way to make sure we you both perceive the thing the same way. Find a common perception, and then you can find a common solution. And again, the people below you, listen to them. Don't exploit them. The worst thing you want to do is exploit people who are working for you. It's not a good thing. And if you work with them, listen to them, you'll be successful. Those are the things I learned in Vietnam. Thank you very much. Our third panelist is Justin Frank. Justin was born and raised in Los Angeles. Uh, he is a member of the Dartmouth class of 1964. Uh, however, he actually ended up leaving Dartmouth, transferring to Berkeley. I understand that the fact that it was 37 degrees below zero when he made the decision, that had something to do with it. Justin subsequently attended medical school. In 1969, when he was in the midst of his internship, he was drafted. He applied for and received conscientious objector status and he subsequently performed his CO service in Boston, working at Harvard Psychopathic Hospital. Justin was very active in the movement against the Vietnam War and in other forms of peace activism since the war. He currently resides in Washington, D.C. with his wife, Heather, and he is the clinical professor of psychiatry at the George Washington University Medical Center. Justin. Thank you. This is my second time here, and... Uh, it's really good to be back. I've spent more time at Dartmouth two visits than I think I've done since 1961. But um, what I want to say is that um, when I was in medical school, one of the things I was taught <clears throat> by a very sarcastic faculty member was that minor surgery is surgery on other people. And um, one of the things that uh, Arnold Toynbee said was uh, that history is written for other people and about other people. And what, I'm, what Ed is trying to do and doing, I think, is making history alive because the people in this panel and other people who've been before have actually lived in the uh, intense times during the Vietnam War era, and so we are talking uh, that we lived it, and in fact, when we were living it, we didn't know it was history. Uh, we were just faced with something very immediate, like, do we go to the army? Do we, uh, where do we go? What do we do? How do we think? How do we function? What's the nature of service? What's the nature of uh, patriotism, even? And uh, those were very important questions and very tough, but it was hard to answer them uh, when you're faced with uh, major decisions. So I actually decided to go to medical school, mainly so I wouldn't be drafted because I didn't really want to go uh, to the war. I grew up in a family that was fairly uh, liberal, in fact, very liberal, and um, <clears throat> very anti-war, and uh, there was always a distrust of, of leadership. So. I grew up not really always believing what I heard uh, from public officials. Now it's, of course, we all believe what we hear, but um, because it, <clears throat> we, but that's a separate issue we'll talk about. But but it was a very serious time and a very important time. And when I was in medical school, I remember I had one classmate who uh, was adamantly. Uh, for the war and couldn't wait to go. Uh, and uh, it took me one year of uh, my whole year, he said, it took him one, one year for me to convince him that it was probably a mistake. And uh, it takes that long to convince somebody because it's so, you're, we're patriotic, we care about this country, we want, we want to do what's right. And it's, it's not an easy, uh, easy decision to make. I had another friend, I was very angry at him because he was for Goldwater, this was during the uh, 1964 election, and I said, if you vote for Goldwater, we'll be at war within a year. And of course, a year later he came to me and said, you were right, I voted for Goldwater and now we're at war. <laughs> <laughs> so that affected my trust also of the government. <clears throat> so with that, um, and the way the, the, the great thing about this course 
is that it's an attempt to get at truth. And there are lots of points of view that are part of truth. And the issue is not so much to have an answer, but to keep searching and keep exploring and keep uh, moving forward. And I think that's a service both to ourselves uh, and it's a service to the country. Um, I actually, uh, there were, I was alone in my class uh, uh, because there was a thing called the Berry Plan where you get to uh, <clears throat> sign up with the Army and then you get, uh, in medical school, you get to go into the Army as a, uh, in your, in your uh, specialty. So I could go in as a psychiatrist, let's say, and I would uh, be given credit for my residency and I would, it was really a great plan. They paid you money and everything. And there were 82 people in my class, and I was the only one who wouldn't sign up because I really uh, was nervous about making any kind of a deal with them, the Army, and uh, even though they do great things uh, in other ways, uh, and I still think they do. So, <clears throat> so I got drafted, and then you've read my little uh, bio about that, but it was a very scary time. I got drafted when I was uh, an intern. And I really didn't know which way to turn because you couldn't really be a conscientious objector except for religious reasons. And I was, as a Jewish person, uh, by birth, I never really practiced and I never even had a bar mitzvah. So I was really about as Jewish as, uh, I don't know, as my fellow Christians were. And um, so I ended up having to, I have ended up finding, a, talking with a rabbi who, uh, interviewed me and we spent a lot of time talking about my beliefs and what was important and uh, that really helped a lot uh, to get to it. But a couple of things I want to say that happened that were very emotional for me personally about deciding to be a conscience objector, something I haven't really talked about the last time here. One of them was hearing Martin Luther King, not hearing it, but reading Martin Luther King's speech on April 4th, 1967. I was a uh, in my finishing my junior year in medical school, and the speech came in a in a magazine that I subscribed to, the New Republic, and it was on the very front page of the New Republic, the opening speech. And I had been waiting and wondering when Dr. King was going to come out against the war, and I just I was overcome with what he said and by what he said, and it was was brilliant and wonderful. But he also understood patriots, and I wanted to. I was going to read one brief, very brief. It says, he said, even when pressed by the demands of inner truth, men do not easily assume the task of opposing their government's policy, especially in time of war, nor does the human spirit move without great difficulty against all the apathy of conformist thought within one's own bosom and in the surrounding world. Plus, he said, the issues were perplexing, and they were. So that's the one thing I wanted to say that was important in a, in a deep thing and then became reinforced in 1968 when the police uh, attacked Chicago anti-war demonstrators. And I was in my internship, so I was watching it on television. From, I was in L.A. and this was in Chicago. And it was a devastating experience to see the police attack them. Um, so I'll close with saying that what... Ed is doing is so fabulous because he understands that uh, truth is to the psyche like food is to the body, and that without truth, the psyche starves. And I think that's what we're looking for, and I appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you, Justin. Our, our next panelist is Jim Griffith. Jane is a native of Boston. She is not a Dartmouth alum, but she does have very long-standing Dartmouth ties, and she's very much a member of the Dartmouth family. Uh, her brother, Thomas Couser, was a member of the class of 1968. Her cousin, Jay Couser, graduated from here in 1972, and she had another cousin, William Couser, who was a uh, med medical school graduate. Jane also served in Vietnam, although not in the military. Her service, which lasted three years, from 1970 to 1973, was in the role of director of the humanitarian programs of the American Friends Service Committee in Vietnam. She oversaw in this role a rehabilitation center for Vietnamese war 
victims located in Guangai province in central Vietnam. In the years since her return from Vietnam, Jane has had a remarkable and remarkably diverse and accomplished career. Among other things, she is an expert in the restoration of historic buildings. The buildings that she has, she has overseen the, uh, the restoration of include the U.S. Treasury and Justice Department buildings in Washington. She's also an expert in Asian art. She's published a book on Japanese textile technique. She's also worked as a development officer for nonprofit groups such as the World Wildlife Fund. Jane currently lives in Brookline, Massachusetts. And uh, Jane has some slides that uh, you're going to display. So let me get those set up while you, uh, you start speaking. Yes, um, my role. Uh, as I as I perceive it, is to be the voice of the people that I worked with, witnessed um, in Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnamese people themselves are often not very um, well represented in the history of the war. Um, as I said, as Ed said, I worked at a was the director of the rehabilitation center. Um, we particularly were great. Um, so where do I press it? Oh, we're going to um, off to the side there. So children were the greatest victims of mines that were set by all sides um, during the war. And one of the things I hadn't realized, obviously having had absolutely no experience in rehab work, I had no medical training, I was the director and medical people worked for me or with me. But um, children need a leg every year that they grow the way you would need a shoe, you know, new shoes. It's like the dichotomy of my not realizing what was going on. Um, the problem with slides is... Oh, yeah, okay, so this is just another kid. And... Um, or was, uh, we talked, all of us have talked about the effects of coming back after the war, and one of the things that I find very difficult to do is to pass up an elastic or a rubber band, and um, it's, good Lord, um, it's because... <laughs> this was one of my favorite patients. I don't know if you can see that he lost one eye. He's lost one arm. He's lost part of both legs. But he's the elastic champion. So they played a game like marbles, and they shoot elastics, and he won them. And I don't know if you can tell, but he's woven them into a necklace around his neck. Um, anyway, you can go to the next slide, which was there. This is um, another aspect of my experience, which was unusual, in that I um, worked in an area I learned from the um, the Burns Novick film was called Pinkville. I was working five miles from My Lai, and it was mainly what was called a Viet Cong or a National Liberation Front area, uh, except for military base or Route 1, all of the area was controlled by the Viet Cong. And this was one of my best friends. She happened to work at the center. She stepped on an American mine, lost both her legs. Um, uh, after the war, uh, 30 years later, I learned that she was actually a head of propaganda for Quang Ai, Quang Nam, Binh Dinh province. Um, and she was a very important person in leadership in the revolution and in the PRG government in the South. And just the way um, I think the men that were in the military found that you develop these really deep friendships during war. Um, I developed very deep friendships with um, some of the people I worked with, including this woman. And she saved my life more than once. And it was a pretty extraordinary experience. Okay, to go away. Um, next slide. Um, then very quickly, because I mentioned this all in the essay, um, I had the opportunity to photograph people who were tortured um, by the CIA and CIA training South Vietnamese in torture techniques. Um, 
I was translating for the Quaker doctor who was treating these patients. And this is a, a woman that was paralyzed from the torture. Next slide. Just flip through them quickly. Um, the women often had um, seizures because they'd had neurological damage from various electrical treatments. Next slide. This is a 12-year-old boy that was supposedly carrying medicine to a, what was called the other side. So they picked him up, tortured him to ask him you know, where he was delivering these goods. Next slide. Uh, just as a point of curiosity, there were just twice, to my knowledge, during the war where people were able to photograph um, prisoners who were kept in the tiger cages. And these were cages that were below ground with uh, bars on the top. And um, these are Vietnamese POWs. So they were war, you know, they were captured during war and they were kept in these tiger cages. And they were unable to walk because they'd been kept below ground for so long that their legs had atrophied. But the one in the foreground was 28 years old, and I was 28 when I was in Vietnam. And to me, it was just extraordinary what I had experienced um, in college, skiing up here, um, wearing high heels. I don't know, there were just all these things that came to mind that were so rich in my life while these men um, had been in prison for so many years. And I think that's it. Yes. Um, a lot of it I covered in my in my uh, essay, and I don't want to repeat it. I'd prefer to just answer questions. Thank you. All right. our, our next uh, panelist is Mr. Jim Laughlin. Jim, can you hear me? Oh, but we, we cannot hear you. All right, hopefully we'll, we'll get this... Uh, He's good now? Okay, great. Uh, Jim is a graduate of the Army ROTC program here at Dartmouth. He's also a member of the class of 64. Uh, after graduating from Dartmouth, Jim delayed fulfilling his two-year military service obligation to attend law school. Upon graduating with his law degree in 1967, he reported for active duty. He subsequently was assigned to a military intelligence detachment in Vietnam. He arrived there in December of 1967. Uh, he ended up, over the course of his service in Vietnam, moving down to the Mekong Delta. Uh, there he served as an aerial reconnaissance commander. He flew a total of 77 missions in that role. After leaving the Army, Jim worked as assistant legal counsel at Princeton University and then worked in private practice in Morris County, New Jersey. Uh, he's currently retired, and he lives in Florida with his wife, Pam, who I believe we've also seen uh, in the video feed this evening. Jim. Yes, sir. Please, go ahead. I, I feel very privileged to be here this evening, and if it were not for Professor Miller's efforts, along with those of Phil Schaefer, I probably wouldn't be here, because what, the, what Professor Miller has not told you is that I'm 100% disabled as a result of my service in Vietnam. I was not injured or wounded in the conventional sense, but I was insidiously poisoned by repeated exposures to Agent Orange, which was used uncontrollably in throughout South Vietnam. So I'm dealing with all the ramifications of being afflicted with that disease, including a poker face, which has no expression whatsoever, no balance. I've had to give up driving my car much to my wife's chagrin. My ability to do anything at all is controlled by the existence of various drugs that I'm dependent on. Having said that, Professor Miller told you I served three and three where I've spent perhaps the worst day of my entire life. And I, since I've been retired. I've devoted my efforts to supporting other veterans through service with the disabled American veterans, one of the oldest veteran organizations in the country. I am the judge advocate for Flagler County, which includes about 11,000 veterans. We operate three vans a day, taking veterans to medical and uh, hospital treatments where they can't make it on their own. 
We work with the Salvation Army and other groups to provide housing for disabled vets and normal vets. And quite frankly, there's no reason why any veteran in our county should go homeless or hungry because we have the, the, the facilities and the procedures in place to take care of those people. And that's really all I have to say by way of introductory remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. One, one thing that I, I should mention here is, is that Jim has participated in all five of the, the, the panels that we've organized. So Jim has been a particularly big supporter of, of, of this class and, and this project. So I, I thank you for that, Jim. We're very grateful. Our, our, our sixth and final panelist this evening is Neil Stanley. Uh, after graduating from Dartmouth in 1964, Neil spent over four years as an officer in the U.S. Army with tours in both Germany and Vietnam. In Vietnam, he served as an advisor to a South Vietnamese Army unit. Following his separation from the Army and his return from Vietnam, Neil attended law school. He practiced trial and corporate law in San Francisco. For the past 40 years, Neil has been the CEO or senior executive officer in several property and casualty insurance companies, and he currently owns his own consulting firm. Neil lives in South Carolina with his wife, Morella, who is also here with us this evening. Neil. Hi. Is this on? Okay. No? Okay. Uh, good evening. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. and. To listen, you know, the, the last person always gets to listen to all of the commentary of his predecessors. And it's moving. Uh, and I hope you are moved by what they tell you, because the experience that each of them had, uh, regardless of whether they served uh, in the military or, or worked as Jane or Justin in, in the causes that really contributed significantly to the development of this country is tremendously admirable. Uh, my experience is somewhat different. Uh, I was a, an advisor to a Vietnamese unit. Uh, if you read my commentary, it was quite short. Uh, it really reflected on the, the people that I met there and how those people affected my life, not just while I was there, but also affected my life up until the day, up until today. Uh, and they continue to do that. There are many more stories that I could tell. I went through, uh, we also all uh, interviews uh, and that uh, Professor Miller has set up for us. And I spent two hours this afternoon and I'm still not done with that interview. It's uh, surprising when you start to talk about your experiences, all of a sudden uh, it's like a, a flower opening, it, it, they just flow out. Uh, some of those experiences are not very pleasant. Um, some you want to squeeze out, some you end up laughing at. Um, because we all have had as, as difficult as what Jane went through, uh, I went through similar kinds of things and it, it just breaks your heart. On the other hand, there's some very, very funny things that come out of situations like that, aren't there? Um, I'll, I'll save you the funny experiences, uh, but if you want to ask me some questions on them, I'm sure I can remember them. Uh, I did not, I was a, a regular army officer, and I was in ROTC uh, here at Dartmouth. Uh, my father uh, had been a, an officer in the Second World War, and he recommended that I go to ROTC and I become an officer because he says he said it's a lot easier being an officer than it is being an enlisted man in the army. Um, that's probably true, although uh, he also told me something that saved my life many, many times. He said, when you get in the army, son, you listen to your NCOs. Uh, they'll take care of you. And they did repeatedly. And uh, as Dave said down there, uh, you listen to your men uh, and you don't do anything without that. You, you don't ask anybody to do anything if you wouldn't do it yourself. 
uh, I think I'm, I'm kind of jumping around here a little bit. There, there are statements and things that you do learn. One of the things that I learned very quickly in my Army career was make sure you stay with your men. Um, that meant uh, I ate my, I ate last. They always ate first. Um, I always made sure that they were taken care of before I was taken care of. Um, if they slept on the ground, I slept on the ground. If they stayed up all night, I stayed up all night. And that's the way, you know, you take those things, each one of those things, and you put that back into the career, whatever your career is going to be, once you leave here, remember those things. The people that work with you, work for you, they're your colleagues, they're part of you, take care of them. Make sure you take good care of them because they will take care of you at the end. Um, I ended up in Vietnam as a, uh, an operations officer uh, in a brigade that uh, our responsibility was down Delta, Four Corps, similar to where Jim was located. Uh, we, uh, we were responsible for interdiction along the uh, Cambodian border. And when President Johnson was saying there weren't any people in Cambodia, they were. We were there. I know I was there. Um, so, you know, don't believe what you read in the newspaper or listen to on TV. And most important, don't believe what you read on the internet. Um, but the <clears throat> there's so much there's so much in the in this Vietnam era that is present today in what what we experience. Uh, I'm not going to try to get political here. But history does repeat itself. The most important thing that you can take away from the historical perspective that you're having on Vietnam is it's real. It will come again. And you need to be cognizant of what happened then to be able to make good decisions going forward because you're going to be faced with the same kinds of things in the future. And I know you think, oh my god, I'm never going to have to have that happen to me. Unfortunately, it will. It's the human nature of things. Uh, I hope you get something out of this tonight. We certainly do. I know I do every time I serve on this panel, and I know all the panelists here feel exactly the same way. We get more. It enriches us as individuals and makes us better people. So thanks. Thank you, Neil. Wonderful. We, uh, we have a fair amount of time for questions and discussions, so we're going to move to that part of the program. Um, just to reiterate what I said, uh, when asking a question, if you could please uh, indicate which panelists, since we do have a large panel here, to indicate which panelists to, to whom you're, you're addressing your question. So let's uh, go ahead and, and open it up. Perhaps we can, we can start with some questions from students. Um, hi, my question is directed towards uh, Ram Beers. Um, <coughs> if you would state, um, with your experience in, in Vietnam, with your experience you in speak Vietnam, up, please? yes, uh, with your experience in Vietnam, and um, you being in the Bush administration right before 9/11, do you ever think maybe I should have stayed in the, in the Bush administration during all these different changes that were happening at the time, and maybe like provided like that contribution? and possibly like avoid like kind of like a group big type dynamic that occurred during that administration and possibly shape, alter like offer a different perception to what happened because of your Vietnam experience? So let, let me just repeat the question. I'm gonna do this with all the questions because so we, we get it on the, the recording. So so Ben's question was directed to, to Rand Beers and it was about your service in, in the, the George W. Bush administration and you, of course, as you shared with us, you made the decision to resign uh, due to the Bush administration's decision to, um, to invade Iraq in 2003. And Ben is asking if you've, if you've ever essentially second-guessed that decision, if you thought perhaps it would have been better to stay in the administration and to offer your perspective as a Vietnam veteran and, and the critical perspective that might have brought. 
So Ben, I'll tell a story that is in my written uh, experience. Um, I have thought about that, but what specifically caused me to resign <clears throat> was the fact that I was responsible uh, along with my uh, superior uh, retired Air Force four-star general named John Gordon for organizing a National Security Council meeting for President Bush about counterterrorism and whether or not we were going to make a mistake with respect to counterterrorism by invading Iraq because the decision to invade Iraq had already been made. And um, John and I wanted to have a discussion in front of the president about whether or not the invasion of Iraq would make the war on terrorism at that time more difficult and whether or not it would um, increase the ability of bin Laden to recruit more uh, individuals in support of Al-Qaeda. Um, the meeting took place. The agenda item was gotten to. George Tenet, then CIA director, uh, spoke briefly and said, Mr. President, I do believe that we have a risk here that we need to be highly conscious of in going forward with this, uh, with this invasion. <clears throat> Paul Wolfowitz, who was the Deputy Secretary of Defense at the time, who had also been an ambassador to Indonesia, the largest Muslim <clears throat> company, country in the world, spoke second. And even though you may think of him as one of the instigators of the war, on this issue, he said, I believe that we are going to have a problem here and we're really going to have to pay attention to it uh, while we move forward with this invasion. The third person to speak was Condi Rice, who was the National Security Advisor. She got halfway into her first sentence and the president stopped the discussion and said, the war and our victory will take care of that. Meaning that we were so powerful a nation that our rapid victory in Iraq would overwhelm any thought that any government had of not being able to push the war on terror uh, as the president wanted, and that individuals who might be susceptible to recruitment would be wary of moving in that direction. After I heard that, I realized I couldn't ask the people who worked for me to give the President of the United States their full support when I was not prepared to do that and in good conscience felt that I couldn't remain a member of the administration in the White House. Despite your question, Ben, about what that would have meant, I also think it's probably true had I <clears throat> Spoken those words continuously, I wouldn't have been in the White House very long after that. Another question. Thanks. Who is it? Um, this is directed to Ms. Griffith. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more to your experience um, about being a woman in Vietnam and how that affected let me just repeat the question again. The question is for Jane Griffith, and it has to do with your experience as a woman in Vietnam and how your identity as a woman impacted your experience and, and the work that you did in Vietnam. Great. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, I was an, an anomaly in the sense that... Um, there were some women in the military, but 
uh, there were very few women in civilian capacity in in the area or in Vietnam. And uh, in Quang Ngai, I never had met another another woman except for those who were working with the American Friends Service Committee. Uh, I think what it allowed was a, an open rapport with people that, because I wasn't military there, and because the Quakers were serving people regardless of their political affiliation, um, there wasn't a barrier between me and other people. And Vietnamese are very affectionate with one another. Um, men put their arms around each other when they walk down the street sometimes, and women are, uh, are very, you know, touch each other. And, and uh, I just felt that I, for example, when I photographed the prisoners, you know, <clears throat> they would, um, you know, be sure to ask me questions about myself and, and you know, put their hand on my arm. And it was, there was certain, I think, uh, you know, women talk about it as the way we relate to each other automatically, but uh, it was a real gift in Vietnam to be able to have that ability to relate to other people. And I guess, I also think, um, I don't know, uh, uh, some of us were, were captured and released. Um, that would have happened if we were men or women, but um, again, being a novelty was kind of something that was unusual. And certainly when I went into uh, the, the National Liberation Front areas, people were just very curious um, about what a woman was doing there. So I, lots of questions. Question over here. Hi, I'm uh, Jim Zion. I was a class of '69. Um, this is for Jim Laughlin. Uh, Jim, uh, you were an aerial reconnaissance uh, commander, and at the time, I'm wondering what uh, Agent Orange meant to you on the ground and in the air, and how, if, if your experience, your experience with Agent Orange at the time was something that you felt was helpful, and now how you interact with people who have been affected by it uh, from their service. Jim, could you hear the question, or should I repeat it? I'm not sure I got the full gist of it. Could you repeat it for me? Sure. So the question had to do with your experience with Agent Orange while you were serving in Vietnam during your time as an aerial reconnaissance commander. and. I guess what was your your, your impression or your um, his? Uh, well, my question is: what, at that time, was that something that you found uh, important and helpful to your work? Mm. And subsequently, as we know, it was very seriously not helpful to your health. But I'm just wondering: what at the time, <coughs> what was the perspective of? What was your perspective on others on the utilization of Agent Orange? Right. So the question is, what what did you think about Agent Orange at the time? Was it something that you used that was helpful to the work that you were doing in the military at the time? Quite frankly, I I don't think we accomplished a heck of a lot of a positive nature. Uh, the at the time I was in the Delta, there were no American units there. And consequently, the VC credits were, was very low. They brought in more credits, they brought in more opponents, and the thing just escalated. We, we, was, we would locate enemy positions and radio locations to the Arvin, which is the army. And they'd fire five or six rounds and quit for the day because they didn't have enough ammunition to fire more than that. So I don't think we really did much other than Try to survive. But and they want you to know did A did H Orange were you a final for Agent variety weed killer that they were doing what they were supposed to do. Uh, we now know that there were about twenty million gallons of Agent Orange sprayed in South Vietnam at concentration thirteen times in excess of the EPA recommendation for plant destruction. So, 
I don't know if that answers your question. There's an ask. I'm having trouble hearing you on this system. Well, I, I think you have answered the question. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. You did it. So we you have a, another question from this side of the room, please. Yeah, this question is also for uh, Jane Griffith. Um, firstly, <coughs> the slide you showed was extremely emotionally emotive, or it was very emotive. And, um, I, it was interesting to, com to try to imagine what that must have been like, because I'm only a couple of years younger than what you would have been at the time. Um, so I was trying to, or I guess my question is, um, how did you emotionally deal with all of that torture, especially if you made such deep relationships um, with these individuals um, and were able to photograph them as well? Um, and how has that, for example, affected you now, especially considering the fact that uh, we're serving these people regardless of political affiliation. Um, so I wondered how that affected your opinion on the war and your emotional kind of perspective on them. Okay. Um, the extraordinary thing about the Vietnamese is their um, their intelligence, their compassion, their ingenuity. Um, they were just remarkable people. And although I thought that I was going to be depressed working in a place that I walked into every day where there were a hundred limbless people, um, we were taking people who had lost limbs and we're training them to be prostitutes and making wheelchairs out of bicycle parts and so on. And they took to their professions with great interest so that when I went back in 2006 with my children, um, the same staff was there. And the, you know, like well, that little boy that, had, you know, had lost so much, but he's, he's still gonna win his game with elastics. Um, the torturing was very difficult for me because I, it was just that coming of age moment where I believe my government was good. And um, whereas the, oh, um, yeah, it was just, uh, you know, as much, we could do, and, and being near me lie too, um, you, you think, well, there's aberrations and things happen and so on, but we, we had deliberate policies of um, maiming civilians and torturing um, people. Uh, and it's been very hard for me. Um, it wasn't, in some ways, it wasn't as hard in Vietnam. Um, if I'm I sawed off some children's legs when they came into the hospital once when so many of them were damaged. Um, you sort of go through these things while you're there because you have to. And I know everybody that's been in the military um, will, will speak to that. But it was hard for me coming back um, because um, I gave s three years in Vietnam and then I was in the anti-war movement for another three years. Uh, so I gave six years of my life, and then I went back into my profession, um, and where what I'd done was really invisible. And it really hasn't been until recently, being here, that I've talked about these experiences. But I get very worked up over the fact that the New York Times says today that um, uh, the new policy in Afghanistan is that we're going to have um, hired contractors and CIA running counterinsurgency um, operations. So one, we don't know what's going on. Second, there are people that are going to get injured in, in Afghanistan, civilians. Um, and it hurts me to think that there'll also be people that are part of the Dartmouth class that will be involved in that as well. So it, it, it's been both a really positive experience for me through my friendships in Vietnam, but it's also been, I think, a, a very isolating experience 
uh, I think particularly as a woman, because I don't have other women to talk to who are also in Vietnam, and I don't have a vets group. Uh, so you sort of, I have those memories by myself. Jacob. I, mean, I don't know if you can speak to this, but what was your perception of your experience uh, obtaining conscientious objector status versus the uh, experience of others who might have tried to go through that process? <coughs> um, and after you obtained that status, how do you think other people perceived you, and what were your interactions with other people when those kinds of conversations came up? Uh, if you can hear it, that's fine. You go ahead and answer. I heard it. Um, <laughs> first, uh, the question was about my experience uh, in obtaining con conscientious objector status compared to other people and what was it like. Um, and in a way, uh, I now I forgot what your. I think I'm more concerned than I thought that I want to get it right in terms of what your question was. Was. Okay, now, thanks. One of the things that I had to make a decision about initially when I was writing my, uh, you, you write a, an essay and they answer, ask four questions and it's a fairly big uh, project to do. And I had to decide right away, did I want to become a conscientious objector officially or did I want to make a political statement against the war? And I decided that I had to keep my eye on the goal because if I wanted to make a political statement against the war, it would have turned me into a political objector and not a conscientious objector. And I probably would have to go then or else go to jail or whatever would happen. So I had to make a decision and it was very hard to decide to not say something that I was really passionate about in terms of the war that I was really against and very troubled and with the brutality that was going on by the time people realized it in 68 and 69 when I had to testify before my draft board. <clears throat> so it was a hard decision, but I realized that uh, I wanted to be a physician. I didn't want to go to jail. I believed in, uh, uh, in, in clearly that it made sense to me to be a conscientious objector is what I believed and what I was confident about. And so uh, that's how I did it. But it was a tough decision in that regard. In my draft board, uh, which was West LA draft board number 24, um, <clears throat> where I participated in many anti-Iraq war uh, protests, whenever I would be in LA, I would be <clears throat> out there with Wesley Clark and various people. That board gave 4% of applicants conscientious objectorship. And I was really scared because when I went for my hearing, uh, there were only three of the five board members were there. And so I thought I would have a worse chance. I would ra rather have everybody there. And I was thinking of getting a postponement. So I called my lawyer, Carol Smith, who was a, just an amazing person. And she said, what did I tell you? I said, you told me I'm not going to get it. She said, that's right. So you might as well go ahead and do it now, since you're not going to get it anyway. Just go ahead and do your best. And it was very good advice, and I relaxed a lot. The second part of your question, I think, was about other conscientious objectors. And I sort of feel, in a way, uh, nothing in comparison to the intensity of what you know, you're going through, Jane, with having to keep so many of these memories without really being able to talk about them or you know how, how to share them with other people who had common memories. I really don't have other friends who are conscientious objectors. I have uh, my roommate at medical school became a conscientious objector after he was in. He sort of left the army. Um, I don't know how he did it exactly. And I helped him write his essay. But And we're friends, but it was never really talked about because he was never very political uh, the way I have continued to be. In fact, when I went to my residency, um, I was very active and I brought the you know people from the Panthers to Mass Mental Health Center, which was very uh, controversial. 
and did a lot of uh, active anti-war things. So, so I stayed with that. I wanted to say one thing about what, what Rand said, if that's okay, which is that the hardest thing we have in, in, in life, really, is realizing that there are people sometimes who actually don't care what you say. They won't listen to you. They really don't care. And it's very upsetting, let me tell you. It makes me cry sometimes and scream because I actually think that George Bush could not hear what people were saying, partly because he made a decision to go already, but partly because he couldn't take in, he couldn't tolerate what somebody brought up the term even today, cognitive dissonance. He couldn't tolerate in not knowing something. And, not, and he used certainty as a defense against having to think. And we now have a president who does the same thing. He uses certainty as a defense against having to think because he can't. He can only react. And it is very dangerous. And we have a fantasy that people are, you know, going to think and interact. And, you know, people can disagree and people on this panel can disagree. And we do and we argue and sometimes get really mad about things. But at least we try to think and listen about what other people are saying as best we can. There are some people who just don't. And it's very hard to accept that. And that we've had two presidents now who, in the last uh, couple of decades, who don't. It's really quite striking. Thank you. Alex, uh, this question is for Mr. Mears. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, talk about, you mentioned uh, being an advisor for the Kerry campaign in 2004. If you could talk about the moment in that campaign in which uh, John Kerry's war record in Vietnam was made an issue, and what your thoughts were personally as a Vietnam veteran, and also now that our current president receives a deferment as John McCain recently brought up because of uh, bone spurs or whatever, and, and I'm, I was hoping you could uh, just weigh in on, on that issue of how the war seems to continually manifest itself even in our political uh, battles today. Hmm. The um, the war record of Kerry came up uh, in the latter part of the campaign, and the um, charge was uh, that he was basically a grandstander and that he had written his own award uh, and uh, sent it over the radio for uh, a subsequent award. Um, <clears throat> It was um, it was one um, totally wrong um, that he would have sent it, and anybody who had been in Vietnam knew that the the claim uh, wouldn't stand up. Kerry was furious with the the effort, um, but but sadly, um, his uh, political advisor. Uh, said, uh, oh, don't worry about this. It's only on cable network news. And uh, if you comment on it, it will then make it to uh, the, the, the regular networks, which was a total misreading of the situation. I think even at that particular point in time, but political advisors are, are political advisors. And, and then when it got to the regular news, there was an effort to crank up uh, a, a response uh, to the effort, um, which was basically to point out um, that <clears throat> the um, letter, which was at the end of the radio transmission, was a K. And the K stood for the radio operator, not for John Kerry. And that was how you knew who the radio operator was uh, uh, in, in Vietnam, or at least that was certainly my own experience. Um, because you wouldn't want to give away any information about your unit or anything else like that uh, uh, over an open radio transmission, which could be intercepted uh, by the enemy. Um, it was, from a political perspective, um, a, an indication to me um, 
about how much control political advisors have over candidates in a political campaign who get them even to um, uh, do things that they, uh, that they know uh, uh, should, should be done. With respect to the current situation, um, it is yet again remarkable about how much the Vietnam conflict uh, comes into uh, our day-to-day -day life with, uh, uh, obviously, John McCain was insulted uh, uh, in, in a totally unacceptable way from my perspective, but I think most people would agree when, when the current president uh, said he was a loser uh, because he had been captured uh, and that, that he supported uh, winners. Um, and um, so I think what we're seeing played out now between, uh, between the president and, and one of the few people who could say what John McCain said about him uh, on Sunday uh, is an indication, as you said at the beginning, Ed, this is really a part of our fabric, fabric and will continue to be uh, uh, I suspect uh, for some time to come, although eventually we'll all be old enough uh, that maybe uh, you all can have your own conversations without having to read our particular history. Hmm. Virginia, you have a good question. Okay. Questions for Neil Stanley. <clears throat> so I, I know I'm all the way in the back, but um, you spoke a little bit about the cyclical nature of history and how our perception of that history is going to be important moving forward as a nation and a generation. As someone who was serving when the war began, and other panelists may have thoughts on this as well, how do you think percep general public perception has changed about those who served since you came home from the war and what that says about us as a generation and how we might approach an event like this in the future? Okay, I, I think I understood what you said. And uh, when I came back, in 1968, pardon me, 1969, uh, we were, it was a very difficult time. It's very difficult to come back to the country. Um, I didn't have anyone spit on me, uh, but you were not, I was basically ostracized. I didn't talk about my service at all. Uh, I went on to law school and didn't spend any time talking about it. Um, I was in a pretty political situation at that time in the, inside the law school. All I did was keep my head down and, and study, uh, principally uh, because I didn't want I didn't want to have dialogue on what I went through and, and what was going on. Uh, I, uh, Dave, was it you that uh, said that you know, uh, or I guess it was uh, uh, Professor Miller said that. You know, I get a lot today of people saying to me, thank you for your service. Um, it becomes kind of hackneyed after a while. Um, I appreciate what they're thinking. I appreciate what they're saying. But it's got to be deeper than that. You've got to understand what it means to serve. And people serve in so many different ways. It's just not in the military. Uh, I believe service is critically important. I believe you need to serve your country. But you don't have to go to war to do that. Um, and I think a lot more people are recognizing that and coming in and, and, and responding well to it. So I think your generation has uh, done a lot for that. Uh, and I think you, should need to, you need to continue it. But do serve. It's critically important. And do respect those that are going to dedicate their lives to doing something like that. Like my colleague on, the, on my right here. It's difficult. Um, you give up a lot of your life in the process of doing that. But a couple of years, even five or six years out of your life, to serve is critically important for your country and for yourselves and for the people that you're, you're taking care of. Right? I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Dave DiColesta the, the same question. If you could speak, first of all, about your experience when you came home from Vietnam 
as as far as how your experience was was perceived or, or perhaps dismissed by by people you were in contact with and then what is your experience now with uh with with how military services is, is perceived okay um i'm pretty much uh on the same page as my friend down there um i was accepted into graduate school so the uh, minute I got off the plane after my physical, where they didn't tell me that I was just about uh, legally deaf, um, I took off my clothes, military clothes, put on civvies, and uh, that was it. Uh, I ended up in a, a graduate school in a very conservative school, for, uh, Colorado State. And um, to show you how conservative it was, the SDS, I guess it was, Students for Democratic Society, uh, scheduled a march, um, and one person showed up. <laughs> that same person must have been the one that burned down the building that my office was in. But um, because I had such a benign experience, and I don't have problems with flashbacks, and uh, the closest I've come to that is talking with my roommate who was in the audience. He was in Vietnam a year before I, um, Roger Nassau, and uh, we've had some discussions about it. In terms of today, um, someone has sent something about, thank you for your service, and I pulled this off of the internet, and the fellow's name is Joe Hunter Garth. He's a Marine veteran from Afghanistan. He's saying the same thing about thank you for your service, an offering from people who, while meeting well, have no clue we did, or motivated us to go, who would never have gone themselves nor sent their own sons and daughters. Thanking us for our service symbolizes the ease of sending a voluntary army to wage war at great distance, physically, spiritually, and economically. It raises questions about the meaning of patriotism. And if I had one thing to say, it would be, I surely wish there was a universal requirement service, not necessarily military, but if every citizen had a two-year commitment to serve the country and the citizens in some manner where they had to sacrifice some of their own time, um, I think we'd be a whole lot better off and, and have a feeling that we're sort of all in it together instead of the elites, as I would call them, directing the people they take advantage of the military. Um, I think 1% of us is is now in the military, protecting 99% of us. And um, I just wish that more of us could have that experience uh, of serving and being part of something as big as ourselves. Well, oh. um, my question is also for uh, Mr. P. Kalevson. Um, you spoke uh, in your uh, essay about the tension between elite uh, military officers and those who actually serve. And I was wondering if um, the tension manifested in the way uh, you dealt with the local Vietnamese population and also just in general how you navigated um, speaking with people where there's some language and probably might not have been that much of a culture before. But, um, I'm not sure as I got the question. <laughs> um, so the, the, the question, as I understand it, is you. Uh, Mr. DeColesta referenced the, the division between elites and, and, and draftees and, and enlisted men right. in, within the U.S. military. But then you're asking the relationship of that to interactions between Americans and Vietnamese. Yeah, if there was any sort of difference in the way that you uh, communicated with the local people versus okay. how. That's, that's really a very good question because um, – there was a segment of the population, which I think exists today, that treated those people as not humans, but animals. And uh, the mission, as I understood it, uh, didn't become one of, of winning a war so much as how many civilians, how many uh, Viet Cong could they kill? And the body count was the big deal. And I'll recount one uh, experience I had. We were taking fire from the village. I called an artillery. It suppressed the fire. Uh, we went into the village and we were looking for dead VC, and we came upon a young woman and her infant who had been killed by artillery fire. And so I, I 
called in and I reported to my senior officer that we had taken two civilian casualties. And at that point, he dressed me down and said, those were VC. And that's how you will report them in the future. So uh, we had derogatory words for them, like they were called slopes or dinks. And really not treated like humans, fellow humans. Uh, the platoon that I commanded before me uh, had a policy. If anybody was running away, you shot them. It didn't matter what they were. So I had to change that philosophy. Um, there were gang rapes that went on uh, from other officers and their men. And so I had to correct that situation that uh, we didn't do that sort of thing anymore. Um, and the worst experience I had was uh, one, one of my men got uh, pretty well blown up by a booby trap. And uh, the men in my platoon went berserk. And they were shooting everything, uh, chickens, shooting at people. Um, it was difficult to control them, uh, but I did. And then the last thing is um, if we would draw fire from a village, uh, they would return fire. And there was a, a group of people that came behind us with pastors in their hand. We could, I mean, we'd call, but every time we would kill a civilian, the natives would come up to us and, and just, and these guys would pay them 100 pastors for every civilian killed. So um, we did not treat them as humans. And that probably is one of the, the deepest pains I have from that is how we treated other humans. <coughs> this is a question for Secretary Douglas. So in the beginning of your remarks, you talked about how, um, how half the men who died under your unit were was a result of friendly fire. So can you kind of explain like what the conditions were on the ground or what it was like at the top of just how the war was organized that led to so much like so many deaths from friendly fire? I'm sorry, the last part, whether it was what? Um, whether it was like a result of how the war was organized and conducted or kind of what the underlying reason um, yes, to some extent, it was a result of the way the war was organized in the effort of using firepower, weapons of any kind, as a way to go after the enemy. And as Dave said, uh, body counts were uh, a, a huge part of that and using that explosive power, whether it was artillery, whether it was bombs, whether it was rifles, machine guns, or mortars, uh, to uh, uh, kill, kill as many enemy as possible. The strategy was attrition based. And um, uh, as a result of that, um, it led to uh, a lot of uh, indiscriminate fire. Um, in the particular instances, that I related um, that effort to expend ammunition uh, probably led to the bomb being dropped in the wrong place. Uh, the pilot was out. He had orders to, to uh, drop the bombs because it was at night. And they, you couldn't see what your target was, but you were given a set of coordinates uh, and you were supposed to drop the bomb there in the middle of the night uh, because there might be, uh, in, in the case where I was, this was all North Vietnamese <laughs> Army. Uh, there, were, uh, there was no evidence to my sense of whether there were any Viet Cong there. And it was, it was almost all uninhabited uh, area. So um, it wasn't called a free fire zone, free fire zone, but it was in essence a, a, a free fire zone without even the designation. Um, so uh, with respect to the artillery round, um, that was just, you know, a miss. Uh, they didn't produce what they were supposed to. The, the, art, the munitions maker didn't produce what they were supposed to. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the, the answer is yes, and uh, then every situation uh, ends up being very, very specific. Hey, Ed, can I? Yes, please. Okay, a couple things. Um, first of all, 
uh, one of my jobs was uh, to call in uh, every night. I'd go in. I'd get reports back in from all the field locations uh, about the number killed, number of casualties, and any weapons that were captured. Uh, it was pretty clear after about, I did that for about, well, I did it the entire year I was there. Um, and it was pretty clear after about the third week um, that the body counts were terribly inflated. It was just impossible that that many people would be killed um, when there were no corresponding casualties on uh, the friendly side. Secondly, uh, the weapons caches uh, that were reported were surprisingly the same. Um, the same number of machine guns, the same number of even Springfield rifles. Uh, if you know about Springfield rifle, we haven't used those in combat for quite a while. Um, uh, and they were all wrapped in Cosmoline, which protects the rifles. So a lot of fabrication occurred. The second thing I want to say is it, it goes to casualties and civilian casualties. Remember, this was a war. And go back historically in every single war. The greatest number of casualties are civilians, period. Whether it's intentional or unintentional, it happens. I'm reading right now uh, about the Revolutionary War. The number of civilian casualties were huge during that period of time. Think about what happened in the Second World War. Hmm. Think about what happened. In, you know, I, you know, I can go on and on, but it's, it's all there. Um, that's not to justify anything that went on in Vietnam, uh, but it is the nature of war. And I'm not a conscientious objector, but I don't ever want to see another war again. We need to work to make sure that there isn't war. There have got to be ways to be able to do that. I don't think the, the human character is capable of being able to determine that. But those of us that believe that need to stand up and fight for it because it's critically important. Dave. Can I say one more yes, thing please. about friendly fire? And um, it's a story that my roommate might be able to recount. If he can't, I'll recount it for him. But uh, Roger Nassau was in the artillery, and he told me a story about um, just how inaccurate military rounds can be, artillery, um, just because of the nature of it. And uh, I don't know, Roger, is that something you feel like you can tell us, or would you like me to tell your story? Roger was... Uh, my roommate, and uh, he served a year as an artillery forward. They directed artillery in support of ground operations. So, in a way, it's to me, it's not a surprise that more people got killed by friendly fire than uh, not friendly fire, because there was so much more firepower from the US side of things than there was from the North Vietnamese side of things that um, there were just more, more, more chances of somebody getting killed by this stuff than the other, so it's sort of a statistical thing. The other part of what happened, let me, let me tell you what happened. I, I went to artillery school and uh, what they trained uh, as to do the way it worked was you go to, you'd go out on the range out in uh, Oklahoma, have your binoculars, you're looking at a target that's uh, these car bodies a half a mile away, and you're calling in artillery on these on these uh, things. The guns might be five miles to the rear, and uh, you're the eyes of the thing. And what you do is you call in. Um, you call in uh, the, the initial rounds and yet give the coordinates of a place where you're not and where 
which is near the target, but you can't really survey the thing in. You call in two rounds and then you adjust from that. You say uh, left 200, up at 200, and then two more rounds come in, and then you get close to the target, and then you call. When you get on the target, you the next one is fire for effect, and then all six guns shoot three rounds each, and you get 18 uh, rounds going at, at the target. Now, just remember, that's, that's how we learned how to do it. When we were learning how to do it also, in the tables, they had, uh, uh, they had a book of, that showed what kind, how much powder you needed to put behind each round for any distance, the elevation of the guns for the distance, and uh, there was a little column there that showed something called range probable error, which meant one standard deviation. Statistics were invented by the, an artillery person. And uh, they showed one standard, and here we were, we were there, and, and uh, I remember it, the class pretty well. It was sort of early in the morning, and we spent about an hour on this little part of the, of the table there, range probable error, and a lesser one, which was width, uh, I forget what that's called. Um, but most of, the, most of the standard deviation was on the, on the line to the target, as you'd expect, and not sideways to it. Well, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but there were maybe uh, <laughs> Uh, one uh, a typical range probable error, typical standard deviation might have been 50 meters. Okay, so 85 percent of the rounds are going to be within 100 meters, 50 past and 50 short of that. So uh, now instead of and it, that didn't matter to us when we're shooting at a target half a mile away out in the, out in the open. Uh, and so we paid no attention to it. But when you go, when you're doing this in, in a place like Vietnam, which uh, is a jungle and you can't, you don't use your binoculars anymore, uh, and you're, uh, what typically would happen is uh, you might walk into uh, an ambush and, and, um, so you've got people spread out over maybe a, a, you know, 50, 100 meters in an ambush. And, and you're stuck there. And, and you might want to, uh, the company commander might want to have you call in artillery. And what you do is you do some of the, you know, you say, okay, I'll try. And you, you do the two rounds, two rounds, and you get it close. You get it to where you think the target is. Even though you can't see the target because of all the foliage, you call it in uh, on that spot, and uh, you got oh you got it on the spot. And then you call for fire for effect, and that means now instead of two rounds, you've got eighteen rounds, and and if you're in the normal place in a in, a, in an ambush, you're probably closer than fifty yards from the from your target. So with statistics working, you've called in a few rounds on yourself, on, on the people around you. And that's just the kind of the way the math works. And so it's no surprise, really, that you, you would get more people killed by friendly fire in a situation like that when you when you put it that way than, than not. Hope it's helpful. Yes. Hope it's helpful. <laughs> Thank you, Roger. Uh, Madison, you had a question. Uh, my question's for Ms. Griffith. Um, I wanted to ask you regarding um, your experience with civilians um, in Vietnam, how many you felt like were contributing to the NLF cause because they were afraid, and how many you felt like were contributing because they truly believed in communism and believed in the mission statement? Sort of a complex historical question in some ways. Um, The, 
in the South, because you've taken this class, you know that there actually was a legitimate government in the South, the National Liberation Front and the Provincial Revolutionary Government. And the area where I worked had never been controlled by the, by the French. So there was a long, long tradition of wanting independence and fighting against the, the colonial oppressors of the French and before that Japanese, Chinese, and so on. Um, and so the people were very proud of that history and were extremely knowledgeable about it. I, I was often surprised that I would talk to, you know, people who hadn't gone to school and they could give a lot of facts and, and information about um, the resistance in that area and why they were committed. Another sort of interesting fact is that it was more of a, there's also a class struggle in that area in the sense that the, the Saigon, the, the U.S. coming in and supporting the South Vietnamese was creating a class of people who are, were oppressing the Vietnamese. So you had maybe the military attitude is that these people are worthless, but you also had the U.S. paying Arvin people like the, prov the province chief where I was who was extremely corrupt. And I mean, they were as bad as the French to the Vietnamese. And um, it's not true of, of every one. And I know you had that interesting experience with your your second in command or your interpreter, but, um, and then uh, it wasn't, people didn't really consider themselves communists. The term Viet Cong, Viet Cong, was a term that we made up. And so Vietnamese communists, um, anyway, it was what we wanted to call, call the people because of this whole domino um, in our opinion, it was a domino theory. Um, and uh, so Vietnamese was saying, <laughs> what, what are these communists about? Um, or a fr one of my favorite phrases was from a woman who said, well, we're not any stick-in-the-mud communists. Um, in other words, they're not adopting some Soviet or, you know, doctrine. Um, so it was my opinion that people were, um, had willingly committed to the National Liberation Front in the area where I lived. It's not the truth in every area, and obviously people were forced by the, the NLF to do certain things. And um, But the fact that the military cleared almost all of the area where I worked, the Batangan Peninsula, for example, was a huge free fryer zone. And they put these people on a spit of um, sandy land at, on the river edge of the river um, in order to control these people from interacting with supporting the other side. So. Okay, we're, we're coming up on the end of our allotted time here. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Matt, you've uh, had your hand up. This question is for Mr. Beers, Mr. De Calesta, am I saying it correctly? Uh, Mr. Laughlin, and Mr. Stanley. Um, I guess this will be our last question. <laughs> <laughs> you can answer it in whichever way you want to, but can you like talk, speak to your initial uh, feelings towards the anti-war movement as soon as you got back, and then how that changed, you know, come 1973. Like, were you angry? Were you sympathetic to the movement? Just talk to, to us and explain to us a little bit of your Okay. Let me, let me just repeat the question for, for Jim's benefit. So, Jim, this is a question for you and, and for the other veterans on the panel. And the question is, what was your perception of and feelings about the anti-war movement, both at the time when you came back from Vietnam after finishing your service, and then did your feelings change over time uh, as, as, as time went on and after the war? Hmm. Who goes first? 
Uh, Rand, why don't you, you, okay. you start it for us? <laughs> Alphabetical again. Yes. <laughs> Let's see if we can do it right. This time. Um, I came back a week before tech occurred. And my initial reaction coming back was to feel incredibly guilty that I was fortunate enough to have been able to come back and not have to have gone through uh, uh, that particular uh, battle. Because my feelings about the people that I was serving with was that they had to go through all this and, and, and I lucked out. Um, but this is also the time when the, when the anti-war movement finally gained what I would call enough traction in the country in which we had the beginning of a uh, of Gene McCarthy's campaign against uh, Lyndon Johnson, which eventually drove him out of uh, 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 being uh, prepared to compete for the nomination. It was uh, involved the assassination of Martin Luther King uh, and Robert Kennedy, and the anti-war movement became stronger and stronger. So I'm still in the Marine Corps at this particular point in time and beginning um, uh, to really see without <clears throat> the filter that when you were in Vietnam, you basically, the only newspaper you had was called The Stars and Stripes, and it was written for uh, uh, people in the military. Uh, to see uh, uh, what was going on uh, in much greater uh, relief. Uh, so by the time I got out of the military, which was uh, in September, I had watched the riots at the Democratic Convention. So by the time I got to Michigan, which was the home of SDS, um, I had a very different opinion and um, became, at that point, part of the, part of the anti-war movement. Uh, and did so uh, up to and including uh, while I was a member of the Foreign Service uh, to go to anti-war marches in Washington. In fact, I was once seen by one of my superiors uh, uh, in the State Department at the anti-war march when he was driving to work. And I wondered what would happen. He never said a thing to me. <laughs> he never said a thing to me. Dave? Like I said, uh, when I got out, I took off my uniform, put up my guns, and, and quit. And um, I never really gave it much thought. I had a very busy life ahead of me, uh, a young wife, a graduate school. And so I just went into the woodwork. And um, the only thing I can really say about my feelings uh, anti-war, uh, although now I have friends who are protesting what's about to happen, and I will join them, uh, Hanoi Jane, Jane Fonda, um, when she showed up in, in Hanoi and did the things she did, said the things, she, she was used, but um, I had a hard time with that, and I still have a hard time with that. Um, if we're right or wrong, uh, for God's sake, don't do that to the troops, which can really hurt the morale. Maybe the war is not justified, maybe it is, but uh, that stuck with me, and that's probably the the worst thing I can think about the aftermath. I went to the wall, rubbed off uh, the name of my OCS classmate, and that was it. I just didn't get much involved with it, got submerged in what I was doing, and I uh, feel like I survived. I had a problem with Jane Fonda, too, doing that. Um, it, it was hard to take to say that the people who were POWs were war criminals when they were going through what they were going through. Um, and I did not like the violence of the anti-war movement, but I still did feel that I needed to make a statement. Okay. I'm going to ask uh, Neil to respond to the question, then we'll finish up with Jim. Okay. Um, I think I answered a little bit of this before, but I'll, I'll stick it again. Um, when I came back from Vietnam, uh, I really just wanted to forget everything that I'd seen and done. And I really 
I recognized that there was a, uh, the, the anti-war movement was clearly there, and there were people demonstrating. And uh, I won't say I was apathetic, I just wasn't going to participate, uh, because I just didn't want to bring myself to go through, relive those kinds of things myself. Um, I then went to law school, and, and things became pretty heated in my law school class. Um, I uh, told one professor, I'm really not interested in, in what your views are. Uh, really, I'm here for an education. I want to get an education. Um, and it, it was about at that particular point that I realized that you know, my feelings were much, much deeper than that. And I had pushed uh, most of, I didn't talk about my service at all. No one asked me about it, and I didn't talk about it. Um, as time went on, you know, I went and did what Dave did, thank my wife for that. Uh, finally went to the wall after denying it for probably 20 years. Um, it was a cathartic experience. Um, one that really changes how you view and you realize that the death was there, that you're, you're feeling a certain amount of guilt yourself uh, for the death of your friends, even though you had nothing to do with it, but you were there. Um, so, you know, the, the feelings that I have today are significantly different. You know, if someone wants to protest the war in Afghanistan, they should have the right to protest it, and they should, and we should listen. And I, as I said earlier, I believe I don't believe that we should be in Afghanistan. I don't believe we should be in Iraq. I don't believe we should be in North Korea. Um, so my views have clearly changed, and, and my experience in Vietnam made those changes occur. Justin, I think you wanted to weigh in on this. Yeah, we'll, speaking we'll as you. one of the people who was an anti-war person, I did want to say my feeling towards uh, veterans changed a lot, actually, last year, consciously, when I came to this panel and met people who I didn't really know uh, from my class who uh, fought in the war. But I also want to say that I live in Washington, D.C., and I go to the monument every year on Veterans Day or on, on Memorial Day, and I go other days, and I stand there, and I uh, shed a tear, and I don't know anybody who's written on there, but I feel that it's very much part of our life, and it has to be acknowledged. As far as guilt is concerned, which I think many people who fought in the war feel, people who are also... Uh, against the war feel guilt, but in a different way. I felt guilt because we weren't effective in stopping it sooner. I felt embarrassed about being an American for a while, and I felt guilty about my country, and I hate that feeling because I love this place. But feeling guilt is something that I think people feel when they can't affect a change that they would have liked to done and uh, affected. So I think that's part of what's going on also. All right, Jim, we're going to give you the last word here. Can you uh, respond to the question about your response to the anti-war movement when you returned and whether and how it changed over time? Do it, Jim. You're on. You're up. When I was sworn into the Army, it was months before the Gulf of Tonkin resolutions were adopted by Congress. So basically, Neither I nor my classmates, I think, knew very much about it. It might as well have been part of the kingdom of Brunei, for all we were concerned. But you're in law school, and you're relatively isolated there, and it was prior to the movement beginning to take effect. So back in the time, I really took off my uniform and didn't want to know anything more about it. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to deal with it. I didn't want to ignore it. That lasted up until February of 1971. There was a riot on the Princeton campus, and one of the officers. Oh, we lost him. Sorry. 
front of that kitchen shaft. Then they turned her attention to National Hall and they were going to fire and bomb that. Which is, National Hall is one of the oldest buildings in the United States. It, it is the model for the building since Mark Harvard Brock. And my boss was a very conservative individual, a fine lawyer. He was in the middle of the faculty staff meeting at which this, this was being discussed and told the president that free speech and free, freedom of expression were fine, but that didn't entitle these students to go running around the campus. I burned baby throwing firebombs at buildings. And right after that meeting, one of the higher officials at the university approached my boss and told him that the boy, his boss didn't like what he said. And my boss apologized to me and I I told him I thought he was he was correct and I didn't know why he was apologizing. He said, Well, I cost us our job. I said, Oh, come on, Larry. Princeton is a bastion of freedom of speech and free freedom of expression. Sure enough, two weeks later, he got fired. I got fired two hours after he did. So that was my exposure to the worse after that. All right. Well, we didn't get all of that, but we did get uh, a lot of it. Jim, I want to thank you and thank all of the panelists for what has been an incredible conversation and, and learning experience for me and I think for everyone else. Thank you so much.